If you're a livestock producer, then this video is for you. Today in this video, we'll be talking about building soil organic carbon in a livestock and grazing uh, enterprise or situation. So I'll be going over four techniques you can use uh, ranked from the highest return on investment to more or less the lowest, but all around building soil organic carbon. Now this is uh, as part of our soil organic carbon masterclass. So go check it out on our website. It's completely free. There's not even email opt-in. You can also find it on YouTube as well, completely free. Now, if you think back to the liquid carbon pathway, we'll be focusing on that pathway in this video. So make sure you go check that one out first because uh, this will make a whole lot more sense. So the first uh, principle is we want to maintain green plants all year round. Now, typically in a livestock management system, we'll have uh, perennial pastures, which makes things a little bit easier in terms of we don't have these uh, dead spots in our production system where we don't have anything uh, growing or it might be bare. But anyways, the first principle is that we want to make sure we have green plants all year round. And the reason for that is we want to make sure we have photosynthesis happening all year round so that we're feeding our microbes of fungi all year round. And so there's the biggest component to this is making sure we're not overgrazing or undergrazing our plants. And so you may have seen this before. This is uh, more or less the growth stages of a perennial plant. It starts off here uh, where in, in phase one, where the plant is growing from its own reserves. So after it's been uh, grazed or say it's been burnt or even planted, so the starting restarting of the growth cycle, the plant will use its own reserves. So if, if you seeded it, if it's going to be coming from the seed reserves, if it's been freshly grazed, it's going to be coming from the roots or, or wherever it stores its um, carbohydrates. So that might be in the roots or uh, lower down on the stems. But anyways, this will allow the plant to reshoot, produce a green leaf, in which case it's starting very slowly to grow. It gets to the certain point where we enter into phase two, where the plant is now utilizing its own uh, photosynthetic ability to then grow. We get a rapid pr um, production and growth, which is in this uh, red line here, rapid growth until we reach phase three, where the older leaves are actually starting to shade out the younger leaves. And this is where the plant starts to die off. This is where the plant has uh, effectively had adequate amount of rest and photosynthesis will start to decrease at this point because those older leaves are shading out the younger leaves. And so with this, if we want to maximize photosynthesis as well as production, because there's no point in building soil organic carbon if we're not making a profit because then we go out of business. So we've got to make sure we make a profit. We want to make sure we maintain our production system, our grasses or our pastures in phase two, where basically we can graze from this point back to this point. Not so much for, uh, as far into here where we're using up the plant's reserves, but we wanna make sure we still have enough green biomass on the plant so they can photosynthesize and be quite productive up till this point. We don't want to go here because this is unproductive. Um, so we can graze here, go back to here. So this, the time from here to here might be in terms of uh, rest. So say we graze it back, it might take depending on your system, 30 days in a uh, high rainfall environment and might push out to nine days, even like a year, I've seen in some contexts. So this is very much context specific, uh, depends on the amount of rain, uh, your area, how cold it is. Now also if, if you're in the growing season or not. So if you're in, um, maybe not the middle of summer, but in spring or autumn, this is going to happen uh, much faster because you're in a better temperature range versus in the middle of winter, middle of summer, where it's too hot. So all of this really depends on your system. So my understanding is that you'll know a plant is fully recovered once the oldest leaf starts to curl up and die. So at that point, uh, the plant's more or less fully recovered. And it's at this point, and you can take it back to um, the start of phase uh, two. Now with this, you don't want to take it down too much. And it also depends on the time of year. So there, there's a bit of general rule where you take half, leave half, but that uh, it's a good place to start if you just want something rough, but it's not ideal. So during the growing season where you basically want to maintain as much green leaf as possible, really just want to go across the grass and clip basically the top bit. So really uh, tight uh, grazing uh, periods. And you just want to go and clip the top off because if you take too much off, it's going to take even longer to recover. And so during the start of the growing season, if you can just take the top off, um, and then make sure it rests back, 
that will give you the, the most amount of uh, photosynthetic mass, so green leaf uh, mass on the plant, while also maintaining production. And then during the non-growing season, when things start to die off or go dormant, then you can come back in the heavier graze, making sure you leave enough uh, plant there to cover the soil and maintain uh, growing points. So all of this really depends on your growing uh, season, timing, timing is very important. So depends, but this is the general idea, making sure you maintain green plants all year round. Now you might say, yep, that's great, but how do you actually do that? Especially when you have paddocks that look like this, where you have spots in that that look like this, over rested and starting to die and senesce, and spots where it's super green and lush and it looks like it's over grazed. So in this photo here, that's actually a stocking issue where there's not enough uh, cows in there to force the cows or livestock or whatever you have in there to have a uniform graze. Increasing the amount of cattle in there with a shorter grazing period basically acts as more like a lawnmower. You graze everything off indiscriminately. The cows will come in, the livestock will come in and basically graze everything, leaving more or less a uniform um, pasture. And that is difficult. And uh, livestock will tend to prefer different plants over others, just the way it is. The important part is trying to get that uniform graze and giving that uh, plant enough recovery, but also not coming back too soon because if you get the plant to that recovery period, it can really take it uh, backwards. And so the best way to do this is with a rotational or high rotational grazing system, um, things like holistic management or ant grazing or whatever you want to call it, regenerative grazing, will allow, will, or I guess help you maintain this concept. There are things like daily grazes, if you can get up to that. Um, at the most, maybe push it out to four, uh, four day grazes. Theoretically, the shorter grazing periods you can get, so even like within hours, moving cattle hourly, uh, will get you the best results. But practically, it's, it's impossible to constantly graze them unless you have cheap labor and you can have someone there to constantly move them. Um, so we find up to four days is, is good enough. Uh, a week can start to push things, but really, again, it's context specific. Give it a go on your own farm and, and see how it goes. So the next component is increasing diversity. Now, diversity is great, not just because of diversity, but because it actually increases the productivity and the functions of our farm. So each plant has a unique function um, so that when we have more plants and more plant uh, diversity, we have more functional diversity, which is really important because we want as many functions on our farm as possible. We want something that survives in drought. We want something that survives in high rainfall. We want something that functions in lower uh, different mineral conditions. We want something for everything so that uh, we maximize the amount of uh, biomass produced given different limitations. So with biodiversity, we increase biomass production. We also increase microbes as uh, the increase in plant diversity will stimulate uh, quorum sensing. Now, if you want to check out what quorum sensing is, we have a video on it, so go check it out there. Um, but effectively, the idea is that once you reach a threshold of plants, microbes will uh, reach a trigger point or a threshold where their uh, activity rapidly increases. So for that, you want four different families of plants. Here we have a larger um, category of plants. We have grasses. Grasses can be split up into C3 and C4. C4 go better uh, in the summertime. C3s go better in the winter time or cooler areas. And this is quite important for maintaining year-round grain. As you'll see here in this graph, C4s will maximize production during the summer. And then we want something in the winter that also carries that production through. So that's important both for our productivity and, and biomass production, as well as increasing uh, soil organic carbon because we have photosynthesis occurring all year round. So we want both C3, C4s. Next is Forbes. Now Forbes is very broad. It covers a whole range of different plants. This is where we can really get our biodiversity in um, and increase our functions. So Forbes tend to have a uh, taproot that go down into the subsoil, allowing a really good cycling of nutrients. It accesses a whole range of different minerals. There's a lot of medicinal benefits in Forbes. Uh, lots of great flowers to attract pollinators and beneficial insects. And there's also legumes. Legumes fix nitrogen, which is quite uh, beneficial. They have pretty good flowers, which attracts, again, beneficial insects. So overall, in your pasture, you want to make sure you have at least a C3, C4. You also want to make sure you have a legume and at least two forbs. So this will allow you to have four uh, plant families uh, and 
C3, C4 to make sure you maintain um, a green leaf all year round. Now, I would actually, uh, in addition to that, have even more di uh, diversity. So having more forbs, more legumes, more grasses will overall increase biomass. If you're interested to learn more about diversity and how it impacts uh, production systems, specifically uh, cover crops, we have a video looking at the difference between a monoculture cover crop and a multi-species cover crop and why it's important to have a multi-species cover crop and why it's better. Um, you can go check out here uh, again on our YouTube channel. Now the question is, depending on your context as a livestock producer, because you can have some systems where basically you've got rangeland settings, you, you have 250,000 hectares in the middle of you know Queensland or Western Australia, and, that not, and you then have a very large budget per um, you know, 100 hectares. How do you actually achieve these things uh, practically? And you actually might not. So, so in terms of that system, your diversity is going to come more from your uh, grazing uh, systems, making sure you're not overgrazing, uh, making sure everything has enough time to recover, to bring back diversity. If you're in a system where you're planting each year uh, to provide forage for your livestock, then this is easily done just changing your pasture, uh, what seeds you include in your pasture. So again, very much context specific, but trying to increase diversity is a great thing to increase our productivity, which will also help with um, soil organic carbon production. Now, next is nutrition. And nutrition is a little bit difficult. As I mentioned before, um, in systems where you have a, a greater budget per hectare, you can put more into your nutrition. Systems where it's very extensive, rangeland settings, we can't put that much money into nutrition at all. Uh, it's a bit more of a challenge. So it depends. Everything really depends. But nutrition, typically, I think a folio application is probably the most effective, cost-effective way of doing it, as well as time. You can do a soil application, either as a, like a, a mix that goes out, a granular blend, uh, or a soil primer. That's a good idea. Now, I was a champion for soil supplementation, but I think I've probably more changed to a, a to favor folio applications. And there's two main reasons for that. Feed supplements tend to be a bit more expensive on a per uh, nutrient base uh, compared to say a folio. And you don't get as good of a distribution with uh, feed supplementation than a folio. Folio you can get a very uniform distribution of those nutrients across the whole paddock. Whereas if you're just feeding them out, that's subject to very high concentrations of uh, minerals, basically in, in the manure. This works better when you have a high uh, grazing density, stocking density, because your uh, manure distribution is, is a lot tighter. But your foliar, your foliar is just going to a guaranteed even distribution straight into the plant and uh, supply those minerals, it's gonna be a lot cheaper. Either or either, the animal's going to end up with the nutrition anyways, and the plant's gonna end up with the nutrition. Just depends on how you wanna supply it and what your budget is. Soil's cool, you can do it once. Uh, it might last, you know, three, five years, depending on what you apply as well. Just depends on your system. So what we do with clients is we take a soil test to guide our nutrition for this system. We take an Albrecht Plus uh, Totals soil test what that will tell us is exactly what's in the parent material of the soil. So what's completely uh, in our soil, not just what's available to the plant. And so that will actually guide us as to whether or not we need to apply those minerals. For example, we have a client uh, where their soils are low in uh, manganese, just, just in terms of the total, like there is no manganese in this soil. So there's no point in trying to like, increase our manganese in our soil with biological techniques because there's just no manganese in the soil. So we actually need to apply manganese. We can either apply it as a just uh, manganese uh, sulfate or whatever uh, to the soil, or we can apply it as a foliar each season to get that manganese in. But it's one of those things where you have to apply the manganese for the plants to have it. It's essential for the plant to have it. If you don't have it, then you're going to be leaving a potential biomass production on the table. What we have on our website is actually a free soil test analysis. So you can go plug in all your numbers that you have uh, on your soil test and it'll spit out a nutritional recommendation for you. Now it is uh, very general in nature as we don't understand your context, but reading, it's, a, it's an automatic system that reads your soil test and gives you a recommendation. You can get that for free on our website, AgriSoil. 
But anyways, the minerals we're trying to hit are the deficiencies in that soil test. But also we want to focus on the minerals required for photosynthesis. So that's magnesium, iron, manganese, uh, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen sometimes, just depending. Nitrogen, uh, we want it more or less to be the limiting factor in our system. We want to make sure everything else is supplied um, because nitrogen can have a, a dilution effect on our plants. The form of nitrogen is quite important. We don't want to be applying nitrates at all. Uh, amino acid is the best, but also if you're doing it as a foliar, a urea application is really good for urea. Next is the minerals required for protein synthesis. That's sulfur, again, magnesium, molybdenum, nickel. Be careful with nickel because it's a heavy metal, especially if you're then going to graze uh, afterwards. You'd want to leave it for a good, good amount of time. But that can be important for um, uh, the urease uh, enzyme. It converts urea into uh, ammonium. It's quite important. And boron. Boron is also important for translocating uh, carbohydrates as well as proteins and, and minerals around the plant. So we want to kind of hit all these because it sets the plant up to firstly photosynthesize more and then have a high protein content for our livestock. Again, I would go with a foliar, but soil application is pretty good too. Feed supplement more expensive, less uniform, but it can be beneficial for your animal production. So you can see here a whole range of different minerals and what they do specifically for our livestock. Um, you can supply those as well. Now, finally, we have our biology. Biology I've put last because it's uh, probably more or less the most expensive and most uh, risky in terms of getting a guaranteed benefit. And we can only really apply it as either a soil amendment so if we're going to have a soil primer, for example, we can apply it before sowing or as a seed treatment. So if you're planting, say, a forage crop, adding biology straight to the seed, best thing ever. We've got a video on seed treatments. You can check it out. But anyways, we would apply a vermiculture concentrate or extract. So that's really good. Kelp, compost, anything like that. Mycolytes or fungi, inoculants even. That's all pretty good. But again, I would leave this last. The best thing to focus on is your grazing management because it has the lowest um, input costs, I guess, for, on a per hectare base. Um, making sure you uh, get your timings right as well as uh, investing in infrastructure and water. They're, they're your biggest return on investment as uh, graziers and livestock management. Then focusing on diversity, then nutrition, then biology. So all of this will make sure we maintain photosynthesis all year round, increase overall photosynthesis, with diversity as well as nutrition. And then finally, if you really want to get into it, applying a bit of biology, kickstart the system, make sure we have the rhizophagy cycle going, making sure we have uh, mycos or fungi in our uh, system. Anyways, if that was helpful, make sure to check out the rest of the series. Uh, we've got um, a heap of videos out now talking about soil organic carbon and helping farmers uh, achieve that. If you're a farmer in Australia specifically, uh, we can help you achieve this with our consultations, either remote or on farm, looking at things in a regenerative perspective. So you can sign up for a free consult on our website. Otherwise, thanks for watching. My name's Teal. Cheers.